All right, I think we'll get started. Um, good morning, my name is Lillian Dendo, and I am an associate professor from the Department of Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, this has been a really amazing morning, so thank you to the Baker Institute, Dr. El Sarag, for organizing. Um, I am going to be introducing two speakers today, starting with Dr. Gala True, who will be talking about veteran suicide and community-based interventions. Dr. True is an associate professor in the section of community on community and population medicine at Louisiana State University School of Medicine and an investigator at the South Central Mental Illness Research Education and Clinical Center. Dr. True's research interests have been on improving access to mental health care, suicide prevention, and bettering the health of individuals and communities through patient-centered and community-engaged approaches. Today, she'll specifically give an overview of her work bringing together a coalition of veterans, military families, firearm retailers, and other community stakeholders to change the culture around lethal means safety messaging and promoting community-based interventions to prevent firearm suicide. So Dr. Gala True. Thank you, it's wonderful to be here and I really appreciate being invited and being included. Um, there's so much exciting synergy between all the conversations that happened earlier this morning and the work that we're doing in Louisiana. And I think in part, it's because so many of us are coming together to work in this area at this time. It's a very exciting and scary and intense time to be doing this work. We are right across, your we're your neighbors in Louisiana, and we share many um, characteristics with Texas. And in fact, when I go to gun shows, many of the vendors are from Texas. Um, and there, we also kind of have a little bit of a quadrangle, I think, with Texas, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Arkansas in terms of our rates of firearm suicide and homicide, our rates of firearm ownership. Um, we have large swaths of rural areas where there are particular issues around firearm um, suicide. And so that's, you know, I think there's a lot of synergy with what I'm going to talk about today. So um, the focus for our project has been on veterans and service members and military families and suicide prevention. But everything I'm going to talk about today really um, crosses the line and, and can help um, civilians, non-veterans, and we always um, emphasize that in all the work that we do. So whatever I say, you know, can pertain in a lot of ways to um, civilian communities. So I'm going to talk today about uh, the Vision Coalition. It's the Veteran Informed Safety Intervention and Outreach Network. But I want to acknowledge um, that I'm part of a larger team. And in particular, I want to talk about how the members of our team, um, many are veterans and um, have served in the military. Um, and our ambassadors for this program, but also really inform everything that we do uh, with this work. So all of us have personal experience with firearm um, suicide or suicidal ideation. Um, all of us have experience with losing someone to suicide or, or um, someone who's had suicidal thoughts. And that is really driving this work, is our personal um, experience and commitment to the work as well. Um, so just to give a very brief background, we had an initial 18 months of funding from the VA um, and really the idea behind that was the VA said, listen, here's some funding, do something that's high risk, high reward. So you don't really know if it's going to work, but you're going to give it a try and then if, if you have some success, then you may be able to get some additional funding to keep going. Um, and so what we were doing with that work was to build a coalition of veterans, service members, family members, firearm retailers, firearm owners, and all other stakeholders in our community in Louisiana who had a stake in preventing firearm suicide. But we knew that we needed to go about it first by listening and learning, and I think the other speakers this morning have, have spoken to that as well, the importance of language, the importance of um, stakeholder buy-in, um, and the import importance of building trust and rapport in order to um, be able to have some success in whatever we decided to do next. We used a method called deliberative discussion forums. I'm not going to go into great detail about what that is, but essentially it's an approach in public health. It's a method that you use when you think that the public health issue that you're trying to address um, 
encompasses a wide range of views, values, beliefs, and you want to try to work to get people on the same page before you try to implement an intervention. So we spent 18 months or so going out and talking to everyone in the community who would listen to us. There was a lot of trust building. There was a lot of explaining. We're not here to try to talk about taking firearms away. We're here to talk about the fact that firearms um, are involved in our community in 80% of veteran and service member suicides. So it's not like we're paying attention only to firearms. I had that asked of me a lot. Why aren't you looking at other methods of suicide? And we would explain and get, our, get, get on common ground, listen, if we want to make an impact, we need to focus on firearms and the role of firearms in suicide. Um, we had these deliberate discussion forums. They are, they're kind of like town halls where you sort of say like, okay, what are we, what's some of the common knowledge that we can all share? And so there was a lot of understanding what are some of the beliefs about firearms um, that we needed to address and the role of firearms and suicide that we needed to address before we could get on the same page. And we all called them kind of like, you know, myth busting, like what are some of the things that people believe that we need to make sure we address before we stop, start to talk about the role of firearms and suicide. I'm not going to go into all of those, but you're familiar with many of them. Um, it was things like that we're not there to try to take away people's firearms. We're not uh, against the Second Amendment or, you know, that's not the goal of the work. Um, and also to really educate people about the concept of means substitution. So research showing that if someone has a preferred means of um, trying to kill themselves, that they will not, if they don't have access to that means, they're not going to default to another means. So if their preferred method is a firearm and they can't get access to it at that time, they're not going to suddenly decide to switch to another method. Um, another thing that we really needed to sort of bust myth about and talk about um, was the idea that if, if someone wants to kill themselves, they're just going to be successful. They're going to keep trying. If you can prevent them once, they're just going to keep trying. So we needed to get some research out there um, to the members of our coalition in our deliberate discussion forums that says, look, actually the research shows that when someone survives a suicide attempt, 90% um, of people after that do not go on to die by suicide. So we did a lot of education um, around that but in a way that was very, you know, not sort of egg-heady or like academic, but really was speaking to people and saying, you know, using visual methods, using ways of talking about things, um, and really getting people on board into this coalition. We had a private donor who helped us fund a website for the project. I'm going to share the website at the end. Um, and at this website, we really saw it as a hub for gathering together all the information that's out there. There's so much incredible information out there about preventing firearm suicides from the National Sports Shooting Foundation and other organizations. And we're still building that hub, so if you have resources you think we should add there, please let us know. But everything on that hub is downloadable. A lot of things are very, like, one-pagers that are very visually appealing, very graphic. Um, appropriate language so that people can download any materials they need. We keep adding to it, so the more we've been doing this work, the more we encounter people who have um, are survivors of someone who has killed themselves with a firearm, and so we've added postvention resources to the website, because if you're doing this work, you have to be able to say to people who have experienced a loss like that and have maybe haven't had a chance to kind of deal with it, heal from it, they don't know about postvention resources, you have to be able to say to them, we can continue this work together, but you need some postvention resources maybe to kind of help you get to a place where you're able to process some of the loss they've experienced. So we keep adding to that hub. The reason for the private donor was that we were told, don't make this look too much like the VA. You know, don't make it, don't have VA branding on it, but really make sure that it looks visually appealing and like something that people can join. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other funding we've received over time. So I want to speak about our veteran peer champions. We've had two cohorts of veterans who joined the project from the very beginning. They are veterans with lived experience of suicide, suicidal ideation, loss of others in their community from firearm suicide. Um, and they are really ambassadors for the program. They inform everything we do. I come from a participatory action research background. So my belief is that we, we can't do this work without members of the community who are impacted by the issue that we're trying to address. 
being involved in a very deep and sustained and rich way in every single aspect of what we do. So this is our second cohort of veterans. They are paid a small amount as consultants to compensate them for their time and effort. And actually over time, our first cohort of veteran peer champions have moved into being ambassadors for the program. One has become the project manager for the program. Um, and so this is also a way for people who are really concerned about this issue to move into advocacy positions um, that they may not have been in before and to become deeply involved in solving the issues that affect their communities. Um, we do a lot of community outreach and engagement. So very similar to a lot of what's been talked about um, by earlier speakers, we focus on veteran service organizations and active duty and reserve military units, but we also go to firearm groups and community organizations. And one of the things that we've learned both from the deliberate discussion forums, but also just from experience, is how important it is to tailor our message to different groups that we're speaking to. So we have a little bit of a standardized presentation that we use, but then we tailor what we're saying to whatever group we're talking to. So to give a concrete example of that, um, I work with a lot of um, firearm owning kind of Second Amendment rights groups. One in particular is called 2A Coffee, and it is a, um, an African American black firearms uh, Second Amendment rights group. They are very invested in firearm safety, firearm ownership, they advocate for the Second Amendment, um, and they, they lobby um, in the state legislature. Um, and when we have been working with them, one of the things that we've heard from them is that from their perspective, they have not had the right to bear arms since the Second Amendment as other you know, white Americans have had the right to bear arms. From their perspective, they've only had the right to bear arms for 50 to 60 years or so. So their perspective is really very protective of we were sort of trying to catch up in terms of our firearm rights and we don't want you taking them away. So when we work with that community, we're very focused on how do we respectful of the fact that they feel that, you know, that, that they haven't had that right for as long as others and so we really want to be careful not to infringe on that. At the same time, that group is very cognizant of the fact that, um, that firearm homicides disproportionately affect their community and they brought to us the idea that we needed to have some um, materials that we could give out to prevent theft of firearms from vehicles. So that was mentioned um, by Lisa. Um, because the firearms that are stolen in New Orleans and Baton Rouge and urban communities are then used in homicides um, in disproportionately, disproportionately used in homicides in African American communities. So it's just tailoring the message and understanding what are the concerns of a particular community that you're working with and then how do you make sure to meet them where they're at and address those concerns and listen if they bring up new concerns or say you're not addressing this one properly. Um, another example would be meeting people where they're at in terms of their preferred ways of storing their firearms. So a lot of research has shown that in a home, people may have many firearms secured in the ways that we've talked about, unloaded, um, locked, separate from ammunition, but they will keep one firearm um, loaded and more accessible for home defense and self-defense. And so how do you address that? How can you talk about kind of rings of security? Are there ways that they could feel comfortable locking up that one firearm? Maybe in a quick release biometric gun case, there are some holsters out there now that can go on your bedside and have biometric fingerprints so you can quick release the firearm if you feel you need it. Um, maybe people would be willing to use um, other ways of defending their home, such as using you know, the ring system from Amazon or something like that. So we kind of go through talking about lethal means safety counseling with people, um, depending on their reasons for owning a firearm and their comfort level with you know, locking up different firearms in different ways. Um, so our objectives with a lot of those presentations are to recruit new members to our coalition, to identify future, future partners, to spread awareness and best practices, and like I was saying, to meet people where they're at and to disseminate resources. We do a lot of gun show outreach. Um, so I started doing this on my own before COVID hit. And um, over time, we have developed an incredible group of volunteers. We have um, training for our volunteers before they go and volunteer at the gun show. We have a program where any new volunteer gets paired with a past volunteer. 
um, to help them kind of learn the ropes on how to table at a gun show. Um, we have, we use the gun show to identify partners, so we go around to the other vendors at the gun show, build trust and rapport with them, and ask them to either become partners in some way, to display our materials on their table, to send people towards us, and then we do the same for them. So if they're a firearm safety or concealed carry instructor, and we get somebody at our table who says, this is my first firearm, I just bought it, we'll kind of engage them in conversation. Have you taken any firearm safety training classes? Oh, no, you haven't? Well, would you like to go to this group of women firearm owner instructors, um, if maybe you prefer a, a woman to be your instructor? Or you could go to the 2A group if you prefer to be part of a, a black community group um, and get some instruction from them. So we do that at the gun show. We're growing our volunteer base. Um, and as I said, we have some training and orientation. We do things like raffle off biometric gun cases at the gun show. Um, and we have a pilot program we're going to be doing at the gun show where we're going to be giving out either a cable lock or um, a biometric sort of gun case to, and then following up with the people to see which, if their changes, if their practices and how they store their firearms changes at all, and whether the biometric gun safe, um, you know, is used more than the cable lock, because there's some evidence to show that cable locks um, are not always used, um, especially on that one firearm I mentioned that people might want to keep handy. Um, we have a project that. I'd love to have time to talk about more, but I'll just try to talk about it briefly. So we were very aware of the state storage maps, um, like the Colorado one, and those are really growing, and there are many states now that have them. Um, and we actually decided to try to replicate that. But as we were calling the retailers, we were hearing a lot about their concerns um, and, ba and potential barriers to them uh, providing storage. They said things like, if somebody called me and I didn't know them, I wouldn't want to store, I wouldn't store their firearms because I wouldn't know what they had done with it before they came to me. Um, we don't have any training in how to do this. We don't have any training in mental health. We don't have any training in how to talk to this. Our staff doesn't have any training. Um, we heard a lot of concern about civil liability. If someone stores their firearms with a retailer and then they go to get it back, the retailer doesn't know how to tell if the person is doing okay is, has recovered from their mental health crisis or whatever might be going on, if they return the firearm to the person and then something happens subsequent to that with um, someone being harmed, the retailers were saying to us, we don't want to lose our business, so we're concerned about civil liability. So we were hearing all of these things and we said, let's see if we can try this a little bit differently than the gun storage maps. I, I should go back and say we had also done a little bit of looking at some of the gun storage maps and some of the links to the um, retailers were dead. They didn't go anywhere anymore. Um, and some of the stores had closed due to COVID and things like that as we were setting this up. So we thought, well, let's just see if we can do this a little bit differently so that we can feel like we're growing it slowly in a partnership kind of way. So we worked with a number of firearm retailers to pilot a program. We developed training uh, for the retailers and their staff. We um, delivered the training and we looked at um, pre and post measures of knowledge and attitudes and behaviors of the retailers and their staff. And we found that going through the training increased the staff um, confidence that they could talk about safe firearm storage with a customer. It increased their belief that it would help prevent a suicide or other unauthorized access to firearms. And they found that it was a very acceptable training and, and actually asked us to come back and do it again in six months and give them some updates. Um, so we have been piloting that program with retailers. Uh, we have a community of practice with the retailers, so every month we get together with them virtually and we talk about what challenges are they experiencing, how can they problem solve those challenges together, um, and what successes are they experiencing. And um, through that program we have had, we've tracked how many materials they've given out. I could go on and on about the program, but we develop materials with them, including a graphic medicine booklet that explains why someone might want to store their firearms temporarily, um, and a brochure, and, and messaging in their store, and things like that. Um, and so they've handed out thousands and thousands of, you know, handouts in their store. They've had dozens and dozens of conversations with their customers about the program. They go out and give talks about it in their community to veteran service organizations and other groups. Um, and they have stored um, eight firearms for people who um, were having a suicidal crisis. That program is 
got ongoing and we're learning that we need to provide a lot of support for these retailers in terms of mental health resources in the community for them to steer people towards because by having these conversations with their customers their customers are then um, uh, confiding in them you know I'm having an issue with intimate partner violence or I have a teenager in the house who's having a mental health crisis um, or I myself am having a mental health crisis and these retailers need to know where to steer people towards in the community to get that help because that is not their role and they cannot do it and we in order to support them staying part of this coalition and growing this coalition we need to support them um, I'll very quickly talk about our, our another project we're doing we developed um, a lethal means safety um, education module it's a video um, featuring two veterans talking about firearms, safe storage, and different why, raising awareness about it, different options for how to store firearms more safely both inside the home and temporarily outside the home. Um, and that project was developed with input from firearm instructors and um, firearm owners and veterans. Um, and it's available on our website. Um, and we are piloting those materials in concealed carry classes in Louisiana and gathering data from the firearm instructors and students on acceptability, feasibility, and changes in knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors. We came very close to having permitless carry passed in our state in the past legislative session. Fortunately, it was shelved but it was the second time it was going through and I imagine it will probably pass at some point. I certainly hope not, but I, I imagine it will. Um, and so then we're gonna have to figure out how are we gonna get these, this material out um, into the community when people are not required to take concealed carry classes. Um, we also worked, as part of our coalition, we worked to pass legislation in our state. It's the first of its kind. Um, we listened to the firearm retailers and their main concern was about losing their business if they were sued after storing someone's firearms. Um, so we passed legislation in our state that provides immunity from civil liability for firearm retailers who temporarily store someone's firearms for them and then return them if something happens subsequent to returning the firearms as long as the firearm retailer followed all federal and state laws when they return the firearm. Uh, that was us trying to listen to our partners and what they were most concerned about and understanding that they're putting their businesses on the line when they're helping us with this effort and so we need to to listen to that. Um, so anyway, that legislation has passed. We're very excited about it and a few states have contacted us to find out more about how we did that and get some input. Um, so looking ahead, we're developing an implementation toolkit for the um, the Armory Project. Um, and spreading that across our state, but also hoping it can, um, in addition to the state maps that are out there, this could be another way for people to think about how to um, build temporary firearm storage options. Uh, we continue to do the gun show outreach and building a toolkit for that so that it can expand. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're piloting the lethal means safety training and we hope to make it available on our state police website. And now we've started to engage military and family caregivers in identifying interventions actually to um, address um, caregiver risk of suicide because caregivers who have firearms in the home um, and are experiencing you know, burden and stress um, are also at risk of suicide and that's not something that many people are talking about. Um, so I'd love for you to visit our website. You can join the coalition by clicking on a button on the website that says join the coalition. We only send out one email a month to keep you updated on our activities. We don't send out any more than that. Um, and we'd love for you to explore the website. Give us any feedback on anything, um, you know, anything you think we should add there, anything you like, whatever. And I will be here if you have questions for me. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, next up is Dr. Laurel Williams. Um, Dr. Williams is a professor of child and adolescent psychiatry in the Menninger Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Baylor College of Medicine. She has specific expertise in working with adolescents who have suicidal and or self-injurious thoughts and behaviors. 
She's also the medical director for the Texas Child Mental Health Care Consortium. Today's presentation will review the development and early implementation of the Texas Child Health Access through Telemedicine program. She's gonna tell us a little bit how TCHAT came into being, its initial implementation, and preliminary data from this past academic year. Dr. Williams. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me reasonably well? In the back, good, hopefully. So, point, okay. So as a psychiatrist, I often laugh at this when I have plenty of conflicts, but unfortunately, because I'm a psychiatrist, none of them are financial. Um, <laughs> so we don't get paid very much, so you know, just in case. Um, but the reason why I'm here, because I was listening to all these wonderful presentations this morning, and. I was like, I'm really left of center. I, I came into the world of child mental health. I actually like to say that I do family psychiatry, not child psychiatry, because really how you help impact a child's life is you help their family, um, is that we're really actually about prevention. The whole idea of why people decide to go into child mental health is that they work with adults with mental health disorders, and frequently what you hear from them is that my problems started in childhood. So we're really in this sort of space of what can we do to prevent something from happening. The other thing I need to disclose that's not financial is actually psychiatrists are really bad at figuring out if somebody's going to go and do something violent. So we're really not good at predicting um, as a profession that sort of is somebody today really going to go do something or not going to do something. So it is um, a challenge for us, but it's one that we take on every day because we um, feel passion for trying to work in this prevention space and learn from a lot of other people, such as the people I'm hearing from today, about how we can do better at this idea of prevention. This slide hopefully um, points to this idea that we are in a moment of crisis in our country um, across the nation. This is not just a Texas problem. This is a nationwide problem that we have more and more youth across the uh, country who are in crisis related to mental health. The numbers just keep rising. Um, and this um, is looking at emergency room visits. Um, and one of the things that um, happened when the COVID occurred and things shut down is what emergency rooms will tell you across the country is that actually the emergency room visits for mental health crises increased. So as, doc as you were hearing from a, from a colleague earlier, there is definitely um, many youth coming into the emergency room um, because they were not having access to normal care. Um, and even with the normal care, we are really underfunded across the country and specifically in Texas, we're very underfunded. So there's often not places to send people to um, when it comes to what to do and that can lead to an overall state of helplessness um, that makes it kind of feel like there's no way to solve this problem. Um, but in child mental health, we try to stay um, positive and we want to figure out what we can do to kind of maybe be of, of more help. And as again, you can see here, um, the, the rates of um, suicide attempts um, are, are obviously rising. We're seeing rising across different um, racial and ethnic demographics. Um, there is still um, information that the young people who die by suicide still tend to be uh, male predominantly versus uh, women, um, but there's actually rising populations within some of the minority groups that before seemed to have some protection, and for reasons that we don't exactly know clearly yet, those rates even within minority populations are also steadily on the rise um, when it comes to young people. Um, during the COVID pandemic, um, you're correct when you say that you think that more mental health problems are occurring and nobody can tell you otherwise, I'll tell you you're correct, so you feel good about that. Um, but yes, we're seeing more young people who are, are drinking, uh, using more substances, which to me alcohol is a substance, but nonetheless, um, more people who are reporting that they are feeling depressed um, and, um, and more people, um, young people, considering that um, they might have suicidal thoughts or wish to die. Um, when they talk about what we can help, how we can help young people who are in crisis, talking about this idea, I've heard this theme a couple different times today, this morning. My background is actually in attachment and one of the reasons why I work in this space is this idea that I learn from somebody who I trust. That's how human beings work 
And so if I don't trust you, I'm not going to learn from you. So who do people trust is a really important piece of this puzzle that everybody's kind of said over and over again. I trust another veteran. I trust another fire own, owner. I trust somebody who kind of has a similar life experience to me. Those are the people that are gonna make me con convince myself to maybe try a new behavior, try something different. This is one of the reasons why we need in our own feel to have more diversity amongst the providers because we need to, we understand that by having that diversity we actually can help more people more effectively but young people no surprise are more likely to trust people that they know and that they're more likely to tell those people than people that they don't know very well so although we have to have uh, multiple layers of defense i think was sort of how you talked about it the same thing with us there's multiple circles to those um, kind of how we can help young people. And so you can all consider yourself a part of the circle um, because you are part of our community. And some of you may have maybe less of an ability to make somebody really change their mind, but as you get closer to that um, circle of how you feel attached, you're gonna have even greater impact. So this is why we really talk about building up communities to be stronger, and it's not really about one person, one choice. Um, it's really about the whole community. So the Texas Child Mental Health Care Consortium, say that five times fast, um, was developed out of um, a, a two crises in our state. The one was related to the hurricanes and the sort of devastation that occurred um, for families with the uh, hurricanes. The second was unfortunately the shooting that occurred in Santa Fe. Um, so this really galvanized the Texas legislature. There had been lots of really great people organizing before that time to try to talk with the Senate and legislatures around sort of things that we can do on a statewide level. And so this is how um, the Texas Child Mental Health Care Association kind of came into being, was um, based on these two crises. And our vision statement is a bold one, I admit, but that all children in Texas um, will have the best mental health outcomes possible. And we do this by advancing health care quality and access, quality and access. You can have access to something that's not high quality, and we know how, where that leads, so we want to pair it with both evidence-informed, evidence-based, family-centered approaches that we have some sense that know that they work, along with the actual access piece of it, which is often missing. And so this idea with access, with interinstitutional collaboration, I can't tell you how unique this is. If you kind of think about like you're just high school and you had a rival high school, wherever you're from, and the idea that those two high schools would get together and work, just take that to the higher level where money's involved <laughs> with institutions with fancy names and getting them to work together can sometimes be a little bit challenging, um, but we've managed in this con collaborative to really work across the 12 departments of psychiatry and health related institutions in the state of Texas. No other state is doing this. This is actually very phenomenal and very proud and excited for our state that we've made this sort of um, jump to collaboration. Um, and the work had been laid down before the consortium was created with the department chairs of psychiatry for several months before this consortium was created. We're meeting regularly with no financial incentives to just learn how can we work better together. We keep hearing that same theme as well across all the conversations today is that we're going to solve these problems by working together, finding common ground versus finding ways that we're different or we don't agree with each other. So um, this was established in Senate Bill 11 in the 86 regular session. Um, the idea was that we are going to address urgent mental health challenges, improve the mental health care system in the state related to children's and adolescents care, and enhance the state's ability to address mental health care needs. So there's actually several programs that are part of the consortium. My medical directorship role actually is involved, two of them, is the Child Psychiatry Access Network and also the Texas Child Health Access through telemedicine. Again, we all say TCHAP because to say it otherwise, you never get through it. But we also do have a workforce expansion piece. Um, we are also increasing the number of child mental health providers in the state of Texas. And we're also doing some mental health research to maybe inform best practices into the future. So um, the Texas um, Child Health Teach Ads, or even myself, I'm going to say it, this is actually direct care. We are directly um, coordinating care with parental legal guardian permission where kids actually are every day, hopefully, at school. Um, we, we, um, we want to make sure that we can um, help the children where they're at versus trying to make them go far away. Now, I, I work at a particular organization here in, in Houston. I was routinely seeing families driving two hours one way to see me for an appointment. 
that's very disruptive in a person's life. You add on top of that the other sort of aces and challenges that a family may have, you can start to see that even if there might be accessibility, which actually there's really not, um, then just the hurdles to get to an appointment become very difficult for a family. So this is providing access to where kids are sitting. We also provide um, education to the schools themselves based on what the schools say they want. So a local approach. We do not top down say, hey, we're going to go teach you about this thing that you don't really care about. We ask schools, what is it that you want to learn? What is it that you feel like you have a hole in your education, your training, and how can our um, health-related institutions help you with that? And so we do a partnership, and that, that informs what kind of training that we provide at the local sort of school district level. And then we also have a statewide data management system that, again, is starting to become very, other states are now becoming jelly of us. Sorry, I speak adolescence sometime. So they're kind of calling us and figuring out, how are you, what are you doing? How are you using the system? Hey, we might want to have a system like that as well. It's in its very early stages, but I do think that as time moves forward, we're going to have a lot of very important information to share about how the programs are working and what kind of things we can do to inform to make them better. To date, we have over 336 districts across the state of Texas with over 3,000 school campuses with about 2 million uh, covered lives. So that obviously doesn't mean we've seen 2 million kids, but we have the ability um, to, within those school districts to make a referral to teach at if a parent, parent or legal guardian gives us permission to see the child. You can see here, we actually got the money in August of 2019. We started having our first service of, a chi of child um, care, mental health care, in May of 2020, which is really unheard of. I don't actually even know how we did it. It's kind of like childbirth. I don't really remember the pain that it took to get to that point to actually getting funding, making the plan, making the budget, getting it to all the HRIs, getting stood up. It was it's definitely a lot of ongoing phenomenal work. But we have at this point, with the funding that we have currently, covered about 40% of schools across the state of Texas. And there's conversations that are going on because of the tragedy in Uvalde, whether or not we should actually consider about expanding uh, further than that. So we'll see where that goes. We really want to pay attention to, to equity and making sure that this service is truly available to um, Texans um, across the uh, demographics. And we're pleased to say that right now, when we look at our um, information of the sort of covered lives that we are very much in line with across the state, um, sort of the, 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 the racial and ethnic me makeup of the young people and their families. Um, which is not surprising, um, we have served over 6,000 students um, to date since we've started and we do tend to see more young, young women versus young men. This is an ongoing problem about how to help us sort of uh, understand that sometimes if a boy is acting out, being impulsive, aggressive, that this is not a behavioral problem that needs a punishment, that it might actually be a mental health issue that needs some assistance. So we're still going to be working on how we can kind of make those rates get better. It's actually more common to have more young men before the age of 12 have mental health issues. It's when um, we hit puberty that young women start to out, outpace young men. I think that actually has to do with stigma and sort of how we think about the differences in genders, but that is sort of the data that we have. And we actually see a probably a, a nice sort of accidental thirds. So about a third of the kids are in elementary, a third of the kids are in middle school, and the third of the kids are in high school. So again, you start talking about prevention. If I could see a family for the first time when somebody's nine or 10, help them understand what's going on with their child, give them some resources, give them an intervention, um, maybe I'm going to prevent something down the road that we're not gonna have in, for three more years. So this is the sort of golden ticket that child mental health has is, can we do something now when the child's this age before the problem has become in, you know, sort of severe, chronic, and um, difficult to manage, and they've also added new problems on top of the initial problem. Can we actually get in there before sort of that sort of cascade has occurred? But nonetheless, we're there also whether or not the young person is, in, like I said, elementary all the way up into uh, high school. Um, when you see the reasons for why we're being asked to see a young person, these are the reasons for referral. You can see here that the most common reasons that they refer a young person to us for T-chat is either anxiety or depression. Um, followed by anger. And again, a lot of young people who've been traumatized, um, and that we have certainly lots of information about ACEs, the um, sort of adverse childhood life experiences, they're not always going to act sad or depressed. They're going to act angry. And sometimes if we treat somebody with anger with sort of a punitive approach, we actually can sort of f simmer and fuel that anger and kind of um, make it actually turn worse, turn, turn inward. 
Um, but we also do have a significant amount of young people that have um, concerns for suicidal risk, as you see in the middle of the chart at 17%, as well as self-injurious thoughts or behaviors at 14%. Um, so again, the, the sort of issues for why we get a referral run the gamut, which makes sense to us because we're really here for all takers. The only children that we will not see in T-Chat are young people that um, are in the immediacy of a crisis because unfortunately we are telehealth and if somebody's really in a crisis, they may need to be in a safe space um, for that crisis to be evaluated. Um, or if they're sort of acting abnormally and you think they might have already ingested something, that's T-Chat's not for that sort of very immediacy of the crisis. We're also not for very young children that really can't collaborate on a telehealth visit. So sometimes we might see somebody initially and go, you know what, this is not going to work telehealth and help them get connected to a different resource. And then finally, the biggest one, we will not see young people without parental permission. This was very important in the state legislature. They actually talked to me about it kind of excessively. But as a, as a healthcare provider, I do not see children unless their parent or legal guardian has approved of it. So we have occasions where we can't track down the legal guardian, and we have to tell the school, I'm sorry, we cannot see that young person, because we need to have that parental involvement um, from the very get-go for a number of reasons. Here, here you can just see the number of encounters. We're steadily growing um, month to month, and I expect this number to continue to rise as we continue to have programs stand up. One of the things I do want to say about when the program stood up, not all of the, H, the health related institutions stood up at the same time and not all the school districts started at the same time because it's a process, it's a conversation. We have a memorandum of operation, an understanding that we develop with the schools and that can sometimes take months. It includes the school boards and other things to make sure everybody's really aware of what we're doing. We're not trying to go in under the cover at night and see kids without anybody's permission. So that process itself can take some time. But um, as we continue to onboard more schools and more schools start to use the service and the families start to say that, well, they are saying already that the service is helpful, I think we're going to continue to see growth in our service. Um, so again, to date, we've had over 20,000 encounters with the young people that we've seen. Um, when people often ask, well, what are you doing? So a lot of people, again, you know, there's a lot, sometimes a lack of trust that we're trying to help build by providing information. The vast majority of care that's provided in teach is actually an, a therapy intervention. Most of the um, evidence-informed, evidence-based treatments for children and adolescents related to mental health is actually a therapy of, of, of different kinds, um, not go see me a psychiatrist. I'm really the sort of top tier, sort of not, not top tier like I'm the best, but you don't need as many of me as you need of other types of really well-qualified uh, individuals who can provide a psychosocial intervention. So the vast majority of young people that are being seen in T-Chat services are actually getting a psychosocial therapy intervention and or assistance for trying to help them find resources beyond just the mental health issue um, when we discover that there's other things going on that our, are, our job is to try to help figure that out. Um, and we do um, allow for our team to see the young person for a short amount of time, but we can continue to see them if, if, um, if there's really not a place to catch them. So we're not going to just see somebody and then say, oh, sorry, we're done, good luck in the world. If we really can't find a good resource after the fact of our service, we will continue to see that young person. We're going to track that data over time to see where we have additional deserts of mental health care, but we will continue to see the young person. But if we can help them get connected to the next resource, that's what we do, and we do that about 50% of the time to date that we are sending them to different resources. And as you can see here, we have a pretty extensive list of information we're keeping as far as what kind of resource should they go to next. Um, so one of the things that we're going to try to do as we move forward, as I'm almost done, is we're going to try to actually increase our um, reach in getting more ISDs and more schools to participate. Um, we are working very specifically on some specific interventions related to trauma, obviously because of COVID, um, substance misuse, as well as suicide and anxiety. So um, our services um, are typically face-to-face, -face, I'm sorry, as telehealth, but we may have some targeted face-to-face -face interventions. Um, as well as we really want to make sure that we're increasing our ability to do bilingual services, particularly around grief, again, because of COVID. So um, there'll be more to come from us um, in the next bit of time, and we'll be happy to talk to more people who want to learn more about our services. And thank you once again for allowing me to participate in this really cool conference today. All right, we have a lot of questions here. I think I'll start with uh, one of my own for Dr. True. 
Um, I'm curious, what do you think is a way to measure success for suicide prevention initiatives like the one you described? Um, how do you know if it's yeah. working? We actually have a conference in mid-July where a major part of what we're gonna be talking about is how to measure impact because um, right now we're mostly using process measures um, and looking at different changes in knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors of people who are trained or exposed to um, educational messaging. I mean, I think, you know, it's gonna be really tricky to measure success by sort of big things like decrease in suicide rates. Um, I think I really appreciated your presentation and kind of how big the picture is um, and how much can we really move the needle when the picture is that big. Um, so, you know, we're I, honestly, we're still working on that. I think that um, I'm a qualitative researcher um, and what I've heard is that, uh, that we really are kind of changing the conversation and I think we use the metaphor of we want people to think of this as putting on a seatbelt that you don't put on a seatbelt when you're already in an accident or after the accident you put on the seatbelt before and we did change that um, in our country so I, I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for how to measure success but I think it's going to be multifaceted and and probably looking a lot at first at process measures thank you dr. Williams are insurance companies supportive of continued telehealth opportunities for students and youth? Well, one of the things that's actually interesting about TCHAT is I didn't talk about the funding. We are funded through the state. We are not actually funded through um, med uh, medical um, funding. So all services that we do for the child are free. So we actually do not bill their insurance for the care that they have. We did have some pilot prog programs prior to TCHAT where they did have grant funding initially, and then once the grant funding was done, they started to kind of bill insurers, and they saw a huge drop off of families participating. So um, we do need to think through um, what to do from a financial perspective related to insurance, particularly if we want to grow to be larger than we currently are, because it is a billable service. But we also at the same time recognize that one of our goals is access, and that sometimes even with insurance, um, people, for whatever reasons, were not choosing to take the telehealth services. So we're kind of a little bit outside of that conversation right now, and we're, we're happy to be in that space. <laughs> Another question for you, Dr. Williams. Uh, TCHAC question. How do you coordinate with schools and school districts that are removing social workers and counselors from schools to save money? Well, one of the things that TCHAT does require is it does require a school to have somebody on site who could, you know, we pay for the equipment, so the equipment comes in the school, the school doesn't have to pay for the equipment, um, but we do need somebody to escort the young person from their um, um, class into the, the confidential space. So if they don't have um, team members, it could be a nurse, it could be um, a social worker, there could be a number of different people we might designate at the, as the person who's going to help us with that piece. And we may need to do some training with that person so they know what to do in case the young person is, discovers they are in the middle of a crisis. But by and large, um, we find that schools um, typically are, are wanting to partner with us. We occasionally have schools say no thank you, and we say that's fine. We're not, we're, one of the things I'm actually really clear about is I don't want to have a state mandate where I have to say all the schools have to use us, because I think that is just not the best way to go. So if a school has other ways that they want to address mental health um, in their community, we need to respect that. Um, but we actually find more, more schools are wanting to do it and we've helped them figure out ways to use the staff that they have. Sometimes we might use a central location, so maybe they don't have it on campus, but they have it at the school um, business office or something. And so yes, the families have to travel a little bit, but they don't have to travel two hours like they used to to come see me in my office. So it still is potentially a win for the family at that point. Dr. True, legislation does not apply to domestic violence. Why is that? Oh, I may have not been clear because I was running out of time, but in terms of our legislation, one of the concerns that was brought up um, at the initial hearings for the legislation was that um, domestic violence or intimate partner violence advocates didn't want it to um, conflict with existing legislation that was protecting people who are experiencing intimate partner violence from having firearms should be removed from their partner. So it was just basically looking at the wording 
um, of the legislation to make sure that it wasn't conflicting with an existing legislation that was important in protecting people who are experiencing intimate partner violence. I hope that's clear. It wasn't that it, someone could be going to store a firearm for lots of different reasons. The retailer doesn't even have to ask them why are you storing this firearm. Um, so there could be a lot of different reasons, but basically the legislation was just to say the retailer doesn't have to ask um, and they can return the firearm. We do have people who have come in and said, this has opened up a lot of different conversations with the retailers. So they, on our community practice calls, they'll say, I just had someone come in. She wanted to purchase a firearm because she's afraid of you know, her husband or her boyfriend. Um, and I had to talk to her about, this may not be the best way to protect yourself. I'd like to sell you a firearm. That's what I do for a living. But I also think you need to get access to some other resources in the community. And so we've given them resources to give to people. So it's just kind of also giving these retailers a way to talk about all the different things that happen in their shop, all the different situations that come in front of them, and how can they deal with them in more sensitive and thoughtful manners, as they do, but, but with some support. I'm going to follow up because there's another question that I think is somewhat related. If a temporary firearm storage is utilized, is this discoverable? Mm -hmm. And could this be punitive? Mm -hmm. For example, if a divorced spouse is using this in court? Right. I mean, that's a great question that I don't have an answer to, so we'll have to look into that and add it to our um, kind of toolkit. We did. I will say that a lot of these, the reason we have the community of practice is because these questions come up constantly. And we actually have met with our ATF field office to talk through the program with them. They are partnering with us and answering some of our questions. Um, and what we often try to convey to the firearm retailers is that just having, I don't know if they can be compelled to, um, to give out information like this, but they really have to treat the temporary hold in many ways the same way that they would any time that they take possession of a firearm. So once they log the firearm into their, um, it's called a disposition and acquisition book, I think, um, but once they log the firearm into their book, it's actually in the firearm retailer's possession. They're holding it for the owner and they can give it back to the owner, but once they've logged it into that book, they have to do a background check before they can return the firearm to the owner. And if the owner doesn't pass the background check, the firearm retailer cannot return the firearm to them. So I know that doesn't answer that question exactly. I have to look into the answer. But what I'm saying is it's very, there's a lot of conversation that has to go on with these firearm retailers and understanding what is going on within their shop when they take possession of someone's firearm and then return it. I'm getting a notification yes. that I have to stop. There are two more questions that I'll pass on to the respective speakers. and. Maybe you can find them in the uh, over lunch or over break. So thank you so much, both of you, for this wonderful.